I'm joined by John Rustad, the uh, leader of the BC Conservative Party. Uh, as some of you guys may know, the BC uh, provincial government is going to be headed into an election October 19th. And uh, we're really excited to have John here in Calgary. Uh, so my first question, big news of the day. Uh, yesterday, the courts ruled that the Emergencies of the War Measures Act was uh, invoked unconstitutionally. So uh, yesterday you put out a tweet and, and, and you thanked the trucker protesters and the freedom people. Why do you think what they did was important? You know, when you think about our democracy, and first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, when you think about our democracy, um, there is no democracy without freedom. There is no democracy without freedom of speech. And so what the truckers and the freedom movement was really about was fighting for our democracy, fighting for the very values that we have as a society. And without democracy, those values are gone. And so uh, I just, you know, I thought they did they did something great. And you look what's going on around the world today. Look at the protests in Germany, what went on in, in the Netherlands, what's going on in France and in Scotland and Ireland and so many other places. Um, it was all founded based on what happened here in Canada with the truckers standing up for democracy and saying, we think this is wrong. We think measures that are on, it's an overstep of government and it needs to change. So I, I thought that was actually, it was pretty, very brave of them. And, you know, I want to thank them. Yeah. And, and so the protest, uh, as well, definitely all of our viewers will know, it started in BC. And uh, it, it's kind of funny because the Western Standard broke one story and there was actually two trucker protests going on in the Vancouver area at the time. Uh, one was about uh, working hours, wages, and, and the other was about freedom. And, and we kind of watched as that protest started as, as a few trucks from the West Coast. And it really started to hit steam by the time it hit Calgary. And by about that time, you could see across the country that there, there was momentum building. Um, but uh, BC actually had a vote um, to, to condemn the actions of the truckers. And you were, were you the only MLA or one of the only MLAs? The only MLA. Yeah, to vote uh, that you supported the truckers and every other MLA in BC voted to condemn the truckers. So yesterday you called out the leader of the BC United Party and the leader of the NDP and uh, tell me about that. What do you? What would you like to see them do? So I, when that motion came forward, I mean, it was purely political, and I just thought it's completely wrong. I mean, they are basically voting against our freedoms and and democracy, and I thought this is so wrong. So when the when the court ruling came out, which vindicated the trucking movement, which vindicated and and showed that what government did was a huge overreach and shouldn't have happened, I thought, you know what? It's time for politicians that made a mistake to be able to stand up and and own it. And just say, look, we're sorry, you know, we apologize for for condemning the freedom movement. And so that's what I've asked uh, David Eby, the Premier of British Columbia, uh, as well as Kevin Falcon, the leader of the United Party, and all of their members to do. Just put out a statement, apologize for it, and let's move on. Um, because, it, you know, I thought it was wrong. <laughs> but it was, it was actually quite amazing to see the United Party and the um, NDP actually voting against freedom and against the freedom movement and if, but then again you know in, in British Columbia we're always known for left-wing politics and uh, you know that's why I often say three lefts doesn't make it right <laughs> no exactly it's uh, it, it was it's fascinating to see how uh, how many politicians especially uh, to the left on the spectrum um, still even after the ruling came out they said you know the Canada's national security and our economic security was was a threat and that's why they needed to invoke the Emergencies Act. Do you think that our national security was ever a threat? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. This was a freedom. This was peaceful. This was a, a statement that people were making about an overreach by government. And, you know, the positions I'm taking, which is I think we need more direct democracy. We need to strengthen uh, our, our democracy. Um, you know, I think there needs to be freedoms and freedoms of choice, particularly when it comes to things like uh like our healthcare and, and over you know our own bodies, I'm called a danger to democracy by the leader of the NDP. I'm called you know radical and a danger to democracy, and and I understand why because it's a danger to their form of democracy. They have a very authoritarian approach in terms of how they want to do things. Their policies have failed, so they're coming in and trying to force things upon people, and they have no respect for democracy. In in British Columbia. We actually have a situation where a sitting uh, municipal government wants to keep the RCMP as their police force, 
and government is coming in and overruling them and saying, no, you will move to a, 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 a local police force. Mm-hmm. What, what happened to democracy here? Yeah. It's got the same government that's coming in and saying, um, we are going to overrule the official community plans. We're going to say that there's, you know, say that you can have densification in here. There's nothing you can do about it. And oh, by the way, you're not even allowed to have public consultation. It's not even required. What kind of democracy is that? And I'm called a threat to democracy. It's really quite funny, actually, to see how the left will really stretch just to try to force their agenda on people. Uh, it's uh, it's impressive gaslighting. Um, in Alberta, in, in Saskatchewan, there's been a push from, from certain people that they would like to see the RCMP replaced with a provincial police force or more municipal police force. But if Daniel Smith or Scott Moe did what uh, the BC government is doing... Um, there would be outrage. It would be their their uh, just disrespect to the municipalities. They're uh, you know they're the problem with democracy. And you know, here we have uh, you know an actual leader that is pushing through something that the people don't want. But you're the threat to democracy for supporting freedom. I, I know it's crazy, and and this is why I support direct democracy. If, if we're going to do this, like for example, in British Columbia, if we were to consider to going to a provincial police force, and there's some that think that we we should go in that direction. Let's get all the information out to the people. Let's show them what the costs are, what it looks like, um, what the benefits are, what the what the pros and cons for each option, and then have a referendum. Let the people vote. Why don't we support people in in the decision making? People are smart. They're capable. They're they can they're capable of being engaged, and they want to be engaged. This is the what we should be doing with uh, with you know big decisions like that. Well, exactly. You can see in Alberta um, how how the United Conservative Party's pushed more uh, more direct democracy. So, uh, with exiting the Canada Pension Plan, uh, they've they've committed that they're actually not going to do anything until there's a referendum on the subject. So, under you, as you as the Premier of BC, would there be more referendum? Would there be more uh, questions put on municipal ballots and, and stuff like that in the future? I'd like to look at doing that. No, you don't want to do it for everything. Right. I mean, there's you're elected as a representative. Your representative is to represent the people on the decisions that need to be made. However, when there are big decisions, I think it's important to be able to go to people and have a referendum. So, for example, <clears throat> last um, uh, last spring, uh, I think it was February or in that area, uh, I actually moved forward a motion in the legislature to say that there should be no new taxes or no increased taxes unless it's done by referendum. Why wouldn't we go to people and say, look, make the case if we need more money, we'll make the case and say, you know, why are you willing to give more money because this is the benefit? Mm-hmm. And if people say no, then government's got to live within its means and figure out, you know, how to balance its books and how to deal with the issues that need to be done. This is the kind of thing that I think people need to be involved in to renew our democracy because quite frankly, you know, as, as you see with these more authoritarian approaches, both, you know, federally and provincially, uh, certainly in British Columbia, it's a it's an erosion of our democracy and it's an erosion of our freedoms. So that actually uh, comes to another thing. Speaking of taxes and, and a referendum on taxes, BC has, I believe, the first and oldest carbon tax in the country, um, and the cost of living is out of control. Like Vancouver and the Lower Mainland is one of the most expensive areas on this planet to live. Uh, real estate, especially for millennials, is completely out of reach. Uh, and if you're living or if you're working in Vancouver, in, in Vancouver Metro, you're you're living out in the suburbs and you're commuting. If you're lucky. Yeah. So and and, and that also comes to pipelines and home heating. Um, so would you have a referendum then on scrapping the carbon tax? Would you follow uh, Pierre Polyev's lead? And and if and the national tax was scrapped, would you scrap the BC tax? Or would you take that question to voters? Uh, actually, I wouldn't take that question to voters because, quite frankly, that's going to be a piece of the next upcoming election. If people want to remove the carbon tax in British Columbia, vote for the Conservative Party of BC. We will get rid of it. And so... Obviously, with a federal government in place, if we get rid of it uh, before there's a federal election, they could implement their own federal tax. And I wouldn't want to see that happen because getting rid of a federal tax is far harder than getting rid of a provincial tax. Yeah. <clears throat> but yes, I, we would, we're would. we committed to getting rid of the carbon tax. It makes no sense. Half the people in British Columbia today are struggling to put food on the table. And taxing people into poverty is not going to change the weather. It makes zero sense whatsoever to be doing this. It's just a tax grab. Um, and for for governments to be spent on their pet projects. So we want to get rid of it. It's going to put $2.8 billion uh, back in the pockets of British Columbians from last year. And 
The thing is, when you look at the cumulative, by 2031, by 2030, 2031, the carbon tax and associated taxes will be the equivalent to taking $27,000 out of the out of a family of four's pockets. $27,000. I mean, people are struggling, you know, like you said, to buy houses, to pay the rent for food. They can't afford that kind of taxation. That needs to go. So the taxes, reducing taxes would certainly help. I know the carbon tax, it's compounded. <clears throat> it's tax on tax on tax. Um, but that doesn't necessarily fix the housing crisis. And BC's housing crisis is like no other. I don't even know where to start. Where where would you start? <clears throat> well, you know, since 1991, it's been 32 years, 16 years of NDP and 16 years of BC Liberals. And just about everything you can look at in British Columbia is worse off, including housing. Since 1991, housing has gone up by five or six fold while wages have doubled. So wages have fallen way behind the ability for people to be able to pay for housing. <clears throat> so there needs to be uh, some dramatic shifts in terms of how we deal with housing. Um, we're not rolling, we haven't rolled out our housing policy quite yet, but there's sort of three prongs that we're looking at on, on dealing with housing. The first is we've got to figure out how we bring down the development charges by municipalities. Municipalities need to be able to put in new water and sewer and, and, the, and the services they need for housing. So let's figure out how we support municipalities to be able to do that so that it makes it easier for them to be able to move forward with housing projects. The second thing we need to do is, of course, we need more supply. We need to have that come in. And there were solutions that were done back in the 60s and 70s, which drove a significant amount of rental units to be built. We should be looking at the same type of solutions, right, to, in, in terms of creating that environment so that investors can come in and actually build the units that we need. And the third piece, of course, is on affordability, people's ability to be able to buy the houses. And so we're going to have some very interesting policies that are going to come forward to be able to help um, people to be able to afford their, their housing in, in British Columbia. Yeah, I hear that so many times that uh, the, so many good projects die at city council. And, uh, you know, that every council across the country, especially in the major cities, is, is struggling with housing right now, uh, but they're still raising taxes. Uh, I'll give you an example. So in, in Victoria, there was a, a major project which was going to have, um, you know, uh, commercial on the, on the ground floor and housing in the, in the other floors. And um, they, they proposed a five-story building. Well, the local residents complained, saying, no, no, that's too tall. And so they cut it back and forced the developers to go to a four-story building. And the developer said, well, if we're going to do that, we can't afford to put in social housing, this affordable housing for people as part of it. Yeah. And the council said, oh, that's okay. You can remove those. Like, it's crazy. So we've got a housing shortage. And the problem is because the building's going to be five stories instead of four. And then you've got projects in Vancouver, for example, that take five, six, seven years to actually get approved for redevelopment and done. Like, this can't happen. These things need to be able to go through in a very timely way to be able to drive the investment and get these projects going. And so it's there's big shifts that are needed. Government in British Columbia has come in and said, well, we're just going to force councils to do things a certain way. I'd much rather work with councils and find ways to be able to um, uh, set the stage so that these decisions become easier and they can get done. Absolutely. Uh, just eliminating red tape in the, in the process would, would speed things up. But eight years is, is out of control. We don't need housing eight years from now. We need housing two years in the past. Like we, right. we need to or, catch up. Or even 10 years in the past when you look at the demand. I mean, especially with our population growth with immigration, it's, it's, it's crazy that we're bringing people in with no place for them to live. Well, we have no place for them to live, but now we're also bringing in an, an aggressive amount of foreign students. And I... I seen something uh, on your Twitter about this. So you're talking about uh, capping the amount of foreign students that would be admitted into uh, the BC schools then. Well, what I'm actually looking at is, you know, Quebec has taken control of its own immigration. Mm -hmm. I think British Columbia should be doing the same thing. We should be looking at how we control the immigration that comes in to make sure that we're getting the skill sets we need. We have shortages, of course, in healthcare, mm -hmm. um, in education. We've got shortages even with truck drivers, right? Let's make sure we're bringing in people with the skill sets that can that match what we need in our economy. Uh, plus, obviously, room for others to come in. You want to be able to be the land of opportunity, of course. Um, but why don't we take control of that? And, and if we can't get the same sort of rules as Quebec, maybe we can just do it as 100% through what we call the Provincial Nominee Program. But that also includes students. Many, many um, um, students come into the country to get an education, but also as an opportunity to be able to uh, get a job and maybe have an opportunity to, uh, to immigrate into Canada. 
Uh, and that's good. I mean, like I say, I'd like us to have that opportunity. But we actually act have some facilities that are one-room colleges where students come in, register, and then they go directly into the workforce. Mm -hmm. And so that's not only abusing the student uh, in terms of coming in, but it's abusing the process and, and opening up for immigration sort of through a back door without the kind of filter and process that should be done. And so I look at that and think we need to have better control of what's going on with that. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, speaking of healthcare, um, I, I, I find this, it, it's not amusing, it's actually, it's terrifying. But the BC NDP has gone one direction and the Alberta UCP has gone an opposite direction, but they are tackling nearly identical issues, uh, especially in rural areas with rotating hospital closures, ERs being shut down, uh, shortage of family physicians pretty much everywhere. You can take the headlines and you can cross out Alberta and write in BC, but the NDP in BC has decided to double down, spend more money, change nothing, and Alberta's gone a different direction. Uh, AHS has basically been split up into four different areas. They've picked four different areas of focus, and they're expanding access to family physicians by allowing nurse practitioners um, to, to treat uh, in family, like general practice settings. And they've put an aggressive amount of money into healthcare and addictions. BC, on the other hand, has gone the safe supply and, uh, and free crack pipe route. So what, where, where would you change that? What, what exactly, what direction would you go? Well, have we got an hour to cover this? Because it's a big topic. <laughs> well, <it laughs> but uh, so I'll, I'll just touch on a couple of couple of things. First of all, safe supply and decriminalization has been a complete failure. British Columbia now, according to some experts, has the highest level of highest uh, number of addicts per capita in North America. So clearly, what we are doing is not working. It is failing. We need to take a different approach. And I like uh, many of the things that Alberta is doing around that. So we need to be looking at at this different approach in terms of how we deal with addictions. But when it comes to healthcare, there was a court case that uh, went through about a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, where the government essentially was arguing that the system was more and more important than patient suffering. And the worst part is the judge agreed, like. It's patient suffering and, and patients should be the focus of healthcare. So what we need to do is actually we need to look at our system and think, how do we improve this? How can we how can we change this? And throwing more money is not the answer. There's only one other country in the world, as far as I know, that even comes close to following the healthcare system we have, and that's North Korea. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, that's not a model I want to follow. We need to be looking at what Europe's doing and what uh, what places like Australia are doing. We need to have a universal healthcare system that is delivered by both public and private sources. Mm -hmm. It's the only way that we're going to see the kind of improvements and actually create a better morale in our healthcare system so that we can attract professionals. Mm -hmm. So uh, especially the, the Scandinavian countries, they have a very interesting mix uh, of public-private delivery. And, and essentially, um, if, if the public system is unable to help you within a reasonable amount of time, your public dollars, you then take them to a private clinic and you can get the treatment. So, uh, you know, Alberta and BC have this weird relationship where all the Albertans have to go to the Canby Clinic to get treatment, and all the, the BC folks, they gotta come to Calgary to the different clinics to get surgery. So uh, would you be working with uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, probably Manitoba, at coming up with uh, a plan that, you know, if somebody in BC needs a hip surgery and they can get it done in BC in a private clinic faster, those public dollars, are they going to follow that patient to that clinic? So that's that's what we're looking at. We're, we're going to actually put together a, a proposal um, you know, as part of uh, our platform going into the 2024 election here. Um, that's going to be talking about how we can change and how we can create that kind of a model. Now, we may run afoul with the Canadian Health Act. And so that's something that we're going to have to deal with. And certainly we're going to be looking at at partners, people like you know Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, um, New Brunswick, right? Any of those four provinces that have these same problems that would like to have this change. But the key in doing this is it has to be universal. So it has to be available regardless of where that source is. And we should be using whatever source is available to be able to reduce the wait times for, for patients. Last year, I think it was the last number I saw, about 17,000 people in Canada died waiting for diagnostic services and surgeries. I'm sorry, that's a completely unacceptable. At that rate, just on a population base, and we can't get the numbers in BC because they won't publish them, um, we're seeing about the same number of people die, if not even more, 
waiting for diagnostic services and surgeries as are dying from the opioid crisis. And nobody is even talking about it. It's completely unacceptable. Our system's broken. It's in a crisis. We need to be able to be brave enough to have a conversation to say, let's do it differently. Let's improve it. Absolutely. Uh, AHS Alberta actually doesn't publish those numbers either. We don't know how many people are actually waiting on the or dying on the waiting list, waiting for treatment. We are just about out of time, but I have one last question. Um, we've actually seen a party come from third place and win before. Alberta, the NDP did it. Uh, Nenshi, when he won as a mayor here in Calgary, right now, I think the last poll I seen, you guys are sitting in second place. And, you know, how do you carry that momentum into October? Well, obviously, there's a lot of strategy that has to go in around uh, carrying that forward. But people in British Columbia are hungry for change. And what we say is it's not about being conservative or liberal or NDP or green. It's just standing for what's right, fighting for the average everyday person and just being straight up with people. People uh, from across the political spectrum are an interest in what we're doing. And we saw a poll before Christmas that showed the Conservative Party in B.C., um, is actually there's 56 percent of the people in bc are considering voting for us mm -hmm. which is a stretch because the last time the conservative government us conservative party in british columbia formed government was 1927 mm -hmm. we're the oldest party in bc's history but the last time we even elected anybody was the 1970s and so we're coming really completely out of the wilderness on taking the stage here in british columbia but we're putting forward a, a great team we're going to have a very good strategy uh, and uh, and lots of very interesting uh, platform pieces to try to attract that vote in British Columbia. And I think, quite frankly, we have a path to be able to win government in 2024. It's going to be a very interesting year. Yeah, I'm excited for sure. We're definitely going to be paying attention to it at the Western Standard. I know our members are going to be paying attention to it. So where can they find some more information on you, the party, and uh, and and get your platform before the election? So the best thing, best place to go right now is to conservativebc.ca. Uh, that is where our candidates are being placed and, and we're, we're fleshing things out. We've got a lot of ideas on there, uh, but we are obviously holding back exactly what's going to be in the platform uh, so we can use that for the tools we need to do to attract the attention that we're hoping to be able to have in British Columbia. But it's a, it's a good place to come to, as a starting point to follow and get engaged. For anybody that's in British Columbia that would like to be part of it, please sign up and become a member. Obviously, you know, we're looking for donations, uh, you know, building up the party and that side of things. But I really encourage people to get involved and volunteer. Democracy is made by those who show up. So if people want change, get engaged, get involved, help us bring the kind of change that you want to see in British Columbia. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me on. Thanks. Thanks.